Good afternoon, and welcome to the latest episode of People, Politics, and Prose, FPRI's conversations with authors about their works, their careers, and the ideas that drive them. I'm Ron Granary from FPRI, and all of us at FPRI thank you for joining us live on Zoom this afternoon and later recorded on FPRI's YouTube page. All politics flows from the struggle between competing groups for scarce resources. This bland truism has shaped our understanding of political life since the ancients and has been expressed in metaphors such as Thomas Hobbes's solitary, poor, nasty, brutish, and short state of nature and Karl Marx's eternal class struggle. Struggle and scarcity are central to realism and play a significant role in most geopolitical an uh, analysis as well. But what if I told you that life on earth these days is marked less by scarcity than by plenty, as human ingenuity has gradually eliminated many of the factors that once limited human life and human potential. This is not to say that life is now easy and perfect, but the struggles we face are now problems of plenty, of managing the consequences of our success. We have entered a new era, even as our thinking remains rooted in the old. In his newest book, The Taming of Scarcity and the Problems of Plenty, Francis Gavin considers both the importance of the transition to this new era and the problems that it poses. Along the way, he challenges his readers to consider how the very institutions and intellectual frameworks that emerged in the age of scarcity and allowed us to control it from our governing institutions to our understandings of international relations and geopolitics, that those very structures and frameworks may keep us from effectively managing this new era. Whereas the problems of scarcity demanded the mass mobilization and unity of purpose, he concludes, the problems of plenty require nimbleness, innovation, diversity, transparency, adaptability, and accountability to maintain governmental and institutional legitimacy. But, he warns, for these new issues, traditional nation-focused solutions that worked to conquer scarcity are, for the problems of plenty, more than ineffective. They are damaging, or at least they can be. So what are the problems of plenty? Why are they harder to solve than the problems of scarcity? If they are, are we or our institutions capable of confronting them? These questions and yours will guide us in our conversation with Francis J. Gavin. Francis J. Gavin is the Giovanni Agnelli Distinguished Professor and the inaugural director of the Henry A. Kissinger Center for Global Affairs at Johns Hopkins School of Advanced International Studies. He has a bachelor's degree from the University of Chicago, an MA from Oxford, and a PhD from the University of Pennsylvania. And he's previously served on the faculties of MIT and the University of Texas before ending up at Johns Hopkins. He is the author of numerous books and articles, especially Gold, Dollars, and Power, The Politics of International Monetary Relations, 1958 to 1971, and Nuclear Statecraft, History and Strategy in America's Atomic Age, as well as Nuclear Weapons in American Grand Strategy, a 2020 choice outstanding academic title. I have to confess, uh, I have known Professor Gavin for quite some time, and I am uh, one of the officers in his fan club, and I'm delighted to have him here today on People, Politics, and Prose. Thanks for joining us, Frank. Thank you, Ron, for having me. And with an introduction like that, I suggest we just shut down the show. <laughs> I, I mean, it can't, it, we have reached the peaks. You gave a better summary of my book than I could. All those nice things you said, it's all downhill hill from here. So thank you so much for having me. And it's oh, so you, great to see you. You bet. You bet. No, it's, you know, even, you know, this is the, 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 the beauty of the internet. So this is also a problem of plenty, right? Is now we have run out of excuses for not seeing each other because we can see each <laughs> other on uh, um, through electronic means. So what inspired you to write this particular book? I remember when I saw that 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 this is what you're working on because I knew you're working on other things as well, right? This is a little bit of a of a of a departure from grand strategy maybe, a little bit of a departure from your last two works on nuclear weapons. But what's the origin of this particular book length essay? Sure. No, and it's a uh, it's an important question and there were several inspirations. Um the first was I think like a lot of us we went through 2020, 2021 with the COVID-19 pandemic. And it seemed as if something fundamental had shifted and that you have a major crisis that ends up killing upwards of 20 million people in the world, over 1 million people in the United States. Uh, and I would have expected that this would have been a reordering moment. And it struck me that this was a type of problem that was not dissimilar from other types of problems. Um, such as the climate crisis, uh, migration, um, some of the issues around emerging technology, 
And I thought to myself, you know, the, these are a set of challenges that 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 are particularly vexing and in many ways are a reflection of some of our success. The second thing, though, as I as the Biden administration came in to office and even as the crisis was still ongoing, most of the people in our community, instead of focusing on these things, were talking about the return of great power politics, Cold War II, um, things like the Thucydides trap, all these sort of things that while they were certainly mattered and were certainly important, struck me as um, part of an older world. Uh, and then finally, I had to start thinking about how I taught and teaching courses like the evolution of the international system, the nature of international relations, the kind of things that I grew up on and things that you and I are very familiar with didn't necessarily resonate with what I saw as the kind of global landscape. And mm -hmm. so I started thinking about uh, thinking about what it was about how the international relations field looked at the world, where they saw the they saw the international system as a sort of static, as you beautifully put it, this Hobbesian kind of hellscape of competition uh, for scarce resources. And it struck me that that while that described many episodes in the past, it wasn't as helpful to understand these new set of problems. So all of those things came together in kind of generating, all right, I've got to dive down and think about this. And it was a departure for me because it forced me to really upend how I thought about international relations. Right. So so what what is different about scarcity? Before we talk about the question of how we got from scarcity to plenty, what what are the kinds of problems of plenty that we see that are that are different or new? Um, that that are different than what we dealt with when we were dealing with scarcity, right? So, um, the, I, I I have a whole list of of sort of various qualities and characteristics of the problems of plenty, but I think the way to think of it is that our success in taming many of the issues of scarcity, most of which took place in the economic, technological, or informational, or even the societal space generated a new set of problems. So, you know, for example, most of recorded human history, human beings have wondered, can I produce enough food, basic resources, wealth in order to maintain my population, right? This is kind of the story of human history for any number of reasons, some technological, some, you know, organizational, we are actually extraordinarily good at producing enormous amounts of material output you know, unimaginable amount with these wonderful outcomes in terms of doubling of life expectancy, um, all of these other wonderful things. But in the process, we release enormous amounts of carbon, which poison our environment and may doom the planet, right? So the problem of scarcity, which was we don't have enough food, we need more land, uh, we don't have enough fuel, we don't have the basic resources, we can't produce enough surplus wealth to do things, we more or less figured out how to do that in the process of doing that generated these other problems. To give another example, mm -hmm. information. Most of humanity has lived under this shadow of not understanding how the world works, having very little knowledge either about the natural and physical world or about their neighbors uh, or about any number of topics that affect their life, right? So information was scarce. Uh, not only was the knowledge not known, but it those few people who held it guarded it tight and literacy was low. And if you were someone who happened to be literate and you could get access to information about the world, you usually got it through some legacy institution um, that was controlling it for its own purposes. What we have now is on a device that we all own, we can get all the information in the world instantaneously at almost no cost. Right. And if you had told people 100 years ago that that would be the case, they would have said we'd ended up in utopia. But now we understand this explosion of information, this explosion, this unbelievable, unmanageable amount of information has generated a whole new set of issues that we never imagined. And so the argument is that the institutions or the concepts or the policies that were used to tame scarcity quite successfully 
generated these problems of plenty. And not only that, they're the, these institutions, this institutional framework is not particularly good at helping to deal with these new problems. See, and, and that I find that very interesting to consider, right? That once you've solved these problems, but if you've spent all your time or if the institutions have all been built around solving those problems, would you even recognize it if you had solved them? Uh, or will, will and 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 there's there's two ways I want to go with this, but one thing that comes immediately to mind is when we talk about problems of plenty, that plenty is not the same thing as let's say as uh plenty is not the same thing as justice. It's not the same thing right, as absolutely. equality. Right. right. And so it's like we have all this stuff, but now it's a question of how are we supposed to how are we supposed to share it or can we share it um, within states, between states? Um, and how I guess the, the 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 big question is, is that I would imagine that even the the intellectual frameworks dealing with scarcity talked about just distributions, but they always imagined just distributions was everybody has to have less. Right. Um, but how do we imagine uh, dealing with the problems of plenty um, and also being aware that that, you know, it's not that we're we're going to run out of because, well, let me rephrase this one more time. Sorry, I've been thinking about this too much because, you know, we, you know, I noticed that, you know, you could talk about how we have plenty when we talk about fuel, but still many discussions about energy always end up with somebody talking about scarcity and how we're running out. Right. Um, and similar with food, as people will say, we've had we've made this great success with food. But if you get in any conversation, somebody will well, the, the, there's always the the doom element of, you know, well, you know, but you know, maybe we don't have enough food or we will we'll, there will be some kind of collapse. And so where does dealing with scarcity required us to have a degree of optimism that we could solve the problems of scarcity? Plenty in a weird way tends to this this era of plenty t seems to create a kind of pessimism that there are problems that are just that we can't solve them at all. So yeah. how should we how should we approach that? That's a great point. There's a whole bunch of really interesting stuff there in what you said. One, um, obviously, inequality has always existed. But when you generate unimaginable abundance, distributional disputes are going to intensify both between and within states. Yeah. And this is why a lot of people, when they take a first cut at this, they believe that this is kind of a Panglossian or Steven Pinker type analysis, and it's not at all. Um, relative gains, as we know, in international politics are as likely to drive conflict as um, as not. In fact, that's the whole ball game. And we we understand through social psychology that we can have everything we want, but if someone has more. We get angry about it. So right. distri distributing these gains are absolutely a uh, fundamental. The second thing I would say is that there is clearly still scarcity around the world and scarcity can return. The difference is that we have, say 150 years ago or even 100 years ago, we imagined there were physical natural limits in our ability to escape scarcity, that the idea that you would increase agricultural productivity in the 19th century six times, and then in the first 20th century, decades of the 20th century, another six times, basically our ability to produce food, produce fuel, to make it more efficient, um, the natural limits that we once believed were there are gone. That, that, mm -hmm. and, and, as part of the argument is that those natural limits were very much co connected to population. They're totally disaggregated and disconnected. Now that does not mean that there are occasionally going to be scarcities, but those scarcities are often a reflection of politics. They're often a reflection of not the natural limits. There's mm -hmm. literally no reason why we can't have food and fuel for everyone in the world. So the, there's no natural limit. Whereas, right. and, and that brings to your point about the kind of gloom. One of the things I worry about, uh, there, one of the things that I talk about in the book is that just as it, it is bad to assume unending progress and solving problems, which as you correctly point out, was a, a feature of the sort of age of scarcity as we're correcting these things, gloom and anticipating everything's being terrible also leads to bad policies, right? I think if you, you, we're actually on the cusp of another technological revolution where food and fuel efficiency over the next 20 years is just gonna increase dramatically, right? There, mm -hmm. I have literally no doubt our ability to produce 
more and more food is actually just going to increase, maybe not at a Moore's law type of way, but it's not something I worry about. But our mindset is such that, well, through most of humanity, anytime we had those increases, that was threatened by population increases, the Malthusian curse, some other threat. So the the inability to update that assumption can generate bad policy prescriptions. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. And that is not to say producing tons and tons overabundance of food doesn't generate its own problem, the climate problems, problems with obesity, whatever distributional conflicts. But it's just to say, by get by understanding the underlying underlying tectonic forces, you want to orient your policy and institutional solution to that new reality, not try to fight yesterday's battle, which is actually going to make things worse. Well, and and this gets to the the one of the really interesting intellectual aspects of the argument that you're making here is you deal with the problem of was it anamensis uh, and issues of how well we adapt to our new realities or how and how hard it is to shake off what we right. brought in you you make several you make several very good references to that classic essay uh lecture by james joel uh, yeah. from 1968 right so uh you know kids ask your parents um about how in in uh in 1914 and in general right that statesmen political leaders when they have to make decisions they they're carrying around sort of a, a bunch of ready-made ideas that are probably the product of their understanding of the past and they will apply them to the present, even if it means sort of jamming them into place to apply them. They might not see what's going on around them. How do we, how do we address that problem with, uh, in both with ourselves, but also in creating future leaders? Yeah, no, so it's a great question. I mean, I, I did a little version of this book for foreign policy and the, the, the image I use, because people are unconvinced by this. You, you, especially mm -hmm. town like Washington, but I'm sure you encounter it when you talk to people, people just assume the world's falling apart, everything's terrible, you know, there's, we're in this set of crisis. And I use this sort of example of saying an alien is sent down to Earth every 50 years to write a report on the state of the planet. And the alien, she's getting ready to come down in 2024, and she reviews her past reports. She looks at the one in 1974, and she looks at the two most populous countries in the world, China and India are basically subsistence level economies. The largest populous one is led by a complete deranged leader, right? Mao Zedong. The United States appears to be in decline. There's all sorts of issues of uh, the, the world doesn't appear to be going in a good place. And then she looks at the report from 1924 and says, wow, 1974 seems pretty good. They're between two <laughs> world wars. You know, violence is a normal thing. Um, you know, racism, intolerance, uh, uh, you know, misogyny between two world wars. Then she goes back 50 years earlier and she sees life expectancy is 30 years in the planet. Literacy is, you know, sort of you know, incredibly low. And this is not to buy into a Whig version of history, right? Because part of my story is that we're generating new problems. Right. But you can't argue to me that international relations does not change fundamentally if life expectancy doubles and the Malthusian curse is permanently broken, right? right. So that doesn't mean things are going to be good, but it means it's going to be different. And so, I mean, it is challenging at this argument through because I have, I have launched this in three different places and each place I've gone... Uh, I've tried to chose interlocutors, unlike in this case, people who I know violently disagree with the argument. So you know, I had my good friend and colleague, Hal Brands, do the last one. He's Mr. Geopolitics. I had Colin Call, who was the Undersecretary of State for Policy, who you know sees China as his looming threat. And then when I was in London, I had John Bew, who did the Integrated Review, was, um, you know, and, and some other people involved in this. And basically... What I'll get is no one will deny that the set of circumstances are different, but what they'll, one of the problems is that I've come to realize since I'm writing it is that there's political time and historical time. You and I are historians. We see things in longer time frames. If you're making policy over the short haul, you'd say, well, these are longer horizon problems, but I've got a real, I've got to deal with China right now. I've got to deal with Gaza right now. You know, I know climate's a problem, but I got to lower global oil prices, $20 a battle, barrel, I won't get uh, reelected. Um, and so 
and again, this is part of our institutions. We don't have institutions that are, and the nature of these problems are they're longer term, they tend to be nonlinear, the problems of the commons. So distributing political responsibility, right? You know, you, you, it's very hard to monitor climate change or global public health in a world of sovereign nation states, because unless everyone agrees to do everything the same, whatever you do isn't going to matter. It's by having a global travel ban in the middle of a pandemic is so dumb, right? It's just not going to work, right? So, but that's what a nation state would naturally do. And so we're in this very difficult spot. And I don't know what the solution is because one, this, this, this way of doing things um, was so successful. You can understand why you wouldn't get rid of it. Right. One of the other critiques, you know, one of the smarter critiques, you know, my colleague Hal Brands makes is, well, how much of solving scarcity was due to a liberal international order that the U.S. built and constructed? And do you really want to unravel that for this other thing that's uncertain? Right. So, I mean, it's a very, very difficult situation. I would say one final thing. I My experience is there's a generational thing here. Anyone under the age of 35 loves what I wrote, gets it immediately. Anyone over the age of 35, the closer you get, even people, and it's not a left-right thing. Mm -hmm. People under the age of 35 are don't have a lot of sympathy for legacy institutions or le legacy insights because they see those legacies having produced 20-odd-some years of bad outcomes that don't meet the challenges and problems that they see and they believe are most um, pressing. So right. it's, I'm not sure what the right thing to do, but I will say there is a generational difference in how these arguments are are received. That's an interesting point. The, ge the generational question, right? Is if people remember when things were worse, what is that? Does that, does that anchor them? Like if, if you're, yeah, ironically, a, yeah. It, you would think you would say, Oh, I've seen progress, but my older friends, you know, I say to them, I'll say, well, is life better now or in 1974? They'll say, well, it was better in 1974. I'm like, that's because you were 22 having fun, right? I mean, like, of course life was better. <laughs> was life better for the United States in 1974? Of course not. We're in the Hard middle of the Vietnam War, water great crime, cities were burning. The U.S. appeared to be in decline. Um, the world seemed uncertain. Of course, like there are bad things now, but comparatively, but young people, um, you know, for them, their concern is there's no obvious institutional or even intellectual response to what they see as these pressing challenges. Mm -hmm. Having big debates about realism versus liberal internationalism doesn't kind of begin to have a cut at these problems. Yeah. I mean, well, and and th that's that's uh, this whole question about, you know, w w if we're going to argue about we're arguing about how we're supposed to argue, right? We're arguing about the terms of our argument or the terms of our analysis and that there is an intellectual value in that, but we have to move on to these other things as well, which is a, is a good moment for me to remind the audience that you are, of course, all invited to be part of this conversation. Please use the Q&A feature of Zoom in order to uh, uh, add a question to the conversation. Um, so the, the, the more questions you come up with, the less you have to listen to me um, ask Frank things. But I'm going to ask Frank another question. That is, you mentioned, you use this, the um, the um, extraterrestrial visitor option. And it reminds me of my favorite extraterrestrial thought experiment. And this was Ronald Reagan had a habit when meeting with Mikhail Gorbachev, in addition to saying, you know, trust, but verify, as he said to him on more than one occasion, if the earth was ever menaced by an extraterrestrial force, we would all come together against it. And that's why we need to understand that how whatever political differences we have would be less significant in the face of some kind of planet threatening uh, threat. And I'm, I'm, you know, Reagan was clearly convinced by this, Gorbachev a little less so. But when I look at, say, the COVID example, right, we were threatened by a planet threatening alien force that we didn't understand that we couldn't reason with it. And we didn't really come together as we as as we should have, right? And I, I guess I'm trying to think. So is that, and because this was, as you say, right? This is exactly the kind of problems of plenty is with 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 all the possibility of travel, with all the possibility of movement. This was not something that individual states could just pull up the drawbridge and protect themselves from. And so we were faced with a new problem, and we couldn't really get out of our own way to solve it. 
Um, so I want to I want to ask your opinion on that. And related to that is is you know we can talk about how the circumstances of life on Earth have changed, but we as human beings, right? We haven't changed, right? You know, we're the problem, right? Yeah. We're we're terrible, right? We're short sighted, right? We're selfish. Even when things are getting better, we don't see it because maybe we don't want to, right? So in, and so with that, I think is one of those interesting change and continuity problems, right? Is the circumstances of life are very different. But we're as terrible as we've ever been. Yeah. Um, this is we at the war college, we talk a lot about the nature and character of war, right? The character changes, but the nature stays the same. So we have this the nature and character of human society. The character changes, but the, but do we change? And that's my big problem with Pinker is right. I don't believe that we've gotten any better as right. people, even if I think life, even though I agree with you that like life is better and different. And so so how do we then resolve, first of all, right, this, this, the COVID example is, you know, how we dealt with the problems of, of, of plenty, but also how do we deal with the issues of both, both as a practical matter, but also even as an intellectual matter, how do we deal with the issue of human nature and that maybe we're just the problem? So these are great questions on the first, which has troubled me. I talked to some, actually this, this terrific historian who has a very interesting book that deals with some of these things coming out, Niels Gilman about this recently and his point was that the covid crisis was almost designed to expose rifts in a mm -hmm. way uh, this wouldn't that it, it's it's it lethality was high but not super high right if you right. had had the lethality was you know five out of a hundred and unlike say the 1919 flu which you know hit children this one hit older populations um and his argument is that because uh, I think we know that another one will appear at some point and the odds are its lethality could be, be higher. His argument was that it was particularly um, designed to highlight uh, some of these challenges. I, I don't know if that's right or not, um, but it gets to this great question of which I don't have a full answer for is what is the governance solution to this right because right. part of my argument is that the modern nation state and a lot of our governing institutions all the way around down to local governance are a reaction to problems of scarcity they resolve them they do a really good job you know if you live in Philadelphia you don't have to worry about getting yellow fever or the city burning down or you know very flooding various other things only if we uh, win the Super Bowl Frank right only if we win the Super Bowl exactly but um but so short of some cataclysm that forces a complete rethinking of governance, which isn't very practical, world government's not very practical, how do you get around this? And I, I talk about this a bit in the book, um, and it's this sort of obvious G2 answer where you can have two terrible adversaries that can recognize that they don't agree in seeing the world the same way, but there are certain shared um, issues that they can deal with. And we do have a historical example uh, in the 1960s. And I'm one of these people who believes one of the problems I have with the Cold War analogy for today is that, you know, Ron, that the the Cold War was serious, right? I mean, it was the threat of thermonuclear war, which would have killed tens, if not hundreds of millions of dollars of people and might have destroyed whole societies and which was a real threat, right? And you had an ideological and geopolitical competition and difference that was far sharper than anything China and the U.S. is going through today. And, and this is not to diminish the level of, of conflict, but as you know, we forget how bad the Cold War was. Okay. So really right in the midst of it, at the height of it, the Soviets and the Americans cooperate on two planetary issues. One is nuclear weapons. So the Nuclear Non-Proliferation Treaty if you had told someone in 1960 that sitting here in 2024 that we would be in a world where the number of nuclear weapon states were in the single digits, where nuclear weapons had not been used, that their salience in international politics, while still there and unfortunately bumping up a little bit lately, was far lower than it was in 1960, and that there were far fewer nuclear weapons in the world, somebody would have said, what are you smoking? Can I get some? Right. And a lot of that was the Soviet Union and the United States agreeing in a kind of condominium to sort of screw over their friends and to, to work together um, to limit the spread of nuclear weapons, right? And the Nuclear Non-Proliferation Treaty, it's imperfect, it's inherently unfair, but it has succeeded well beyond what anyone would have thought possible. 
And the second example, which is less well known, but has been detailed by our brilliant historian, Aris Manella at Harvard, is smallpox eradication, right? In 1965, 2 million people died of smallpox. In 1975, zero died of smallpox. And the reason is, is because through the World Health Organization, the, the United States and the Soviet Union cooperated to eliminate it. Mm -hmm. And so at the peak of ideological and geopolitical dysfunction and rivalry, somehow these two systems which hated each other got together to deal with the alien problem, nuclear right. weapons, was a planetary threat and smallpox which had killed twice as many people up till 1965 as all the wars combined right yeah so we do have a model now it's not looking very promising right now and for my friends who who are suspicious of this i say to myself i ask them let's say the, the united states through artificial intelligence and medical technology figured out a cure to cancer would we not solve say, share that with China? And let's say at the same time, China had figured out a, a carbon capture program that was safe, that helped climate change, but they did not share it with us. I don't know, right? Because okay. one of the things that was so disturbing to me about the pandemic is global public health is the low hanging fruit of international cooperation. And the fact, and you know, nothing that happened was a surprise, you know, CSIS had run an exercise in the fall that had shown exactly what was, we knew what to do, um, was, was distressing. Um, there are some hints, you know, this, uh, artificial intelligence international, um, sort of, I don't know what it is, consortium conference that started in London in, in the late fall and has been working at sort of AI risks, private sector has been involved, China and the US has been involved, there has been some cooperation. Uh, but that gets to ultimately, you know, this, there's these problems involve a G2 sort of right. uh, on technology on public health. Um, not super, super optimistic, but it's one of the reasons why I want to get away from this kind of simplistic Cold War view, which these people don't even understand what the that this happened during the Cold War. No, I mean, I, I, this is something I've been beating the drum on a lot in conversations and in a bunch of lectures uh, that I've given lately, uh, various places. Uh, the <clears throat> people fall back on the idea of the Cold War because they think that it provides a kind of simplicity, and yet they, and yet by doing that, they forget just how complicated and how and how nuanced the whole the whole thing was. Related to this, right? One, we have a question come in from uh, from Alina Telia Nakova, who uh, asks: um, We're often hearing about the challenges of both past and present and the failures to launch effective responses. And you just mentioned two positive responses. Um, but in the age of new challenge, the problem of plenty, can you provide any examples of political society actually doing good? And I think this is where we could talk about PEPFAR. Yeah. Right. So PEPFAR is a great example. We all, I mean, I, it's funny. I, I was talking to some friends about this. Um, it's, it was just reading the Steve Call book on, Saddam Hussein um, mm. that's just come out, which I think is right. called the, the Achilles Trap. And it's, an, you know, Steve calls a brilliant writer. It's a brilliant book. And, um, you know, the foreign policies and grand strategy of the George W. Bush administration, I think at most generously can be described as, as troubled, right? <laughs> and I, but one of the things that people often forget is in the same speech where the axis of evil was identified, uh, President Bush, very much out of personal interest, talks about PEPFAR, right? And about the idea of providing uh, antiviral drugs to retroviral drugs to anyone in Africa who needs them to eliminate AIDS, and which has uh, been estimated to have saved tens of millions of lives, right? And so, um, and there's lots of examples of this from ranging from you know, eliminating the CC fly to doing all sorts of different things that and chlorofluorocarbons that, actually comes yeah, to mind as well right you know right I mean? no absolutely so there are models there um and a lot of this involves the need in our world to do historical and international relations studies on what kind of organizations what kind of processes what kind of practices so the you know the montreal convention like how did that work out so well you know where's the real you know i let's do the really i, I would rather another IR book, I would rather, instead of another IR book on the July crisis, I would like a book on how, why Montreal was successful and worked, 
whereas Kyoto and Paris have failed, right? Mm -hmm. You know, mm -hmm. um, what is it about smallpox eradication that can give us lessons today? What is it about, um, you know, and to think of those successes? Right. Uh, because, and this relates to another issue that worries me greatly. Institutions, we're in a period where legacy institutions have declining legitimacy. And the reason mm -hmm. they have declining legitimacy is because they don't meet these problems, right? And they don't get credit for, you know, I always say the post-World War II institutions were created to do basically three things, avoid Great Depressions, um, avoid World War III, and handle the massive problem of decolonization in new nation states. Great on the first two, mixed record on the third, but not bad when you think about it, right? Yeah. Um, and you think about local governance, right? You know, everyone, for the most part, gets you know can drive safely on streets, gets access to public education, their neighborhoods don't burn down, typhoid usually doesn't break out. You don't. We've done miraculously well at these problems. You don't get any credit for that, nor does anyone think about that. No one thinks when their Amazon package is a day late, they don't say like, what a miracle of modern science, <laughs> technology, and liberal capitalism. And they're like, where the hell is my Amazon package? Just shows you that like the world doesn't work. And so that's that's my that's my luggage lost luggage at the airport, right? Right. right. It's a it's 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 a wonder anybody yeah. gets their their suitcases anytime. No, and and so so one of the challenges we have is now whole new set of problems and our institutions fail at those so people say governance doesn't work and instead you say well governance works so well that it solved these problems but it's not for, for, for purpose for these new set of problems yeah. and so what do you do it's very hard that's why identifying and making it clear what the characteristics and qualities of these new problems are so when you design policy and institutional solutions to them they reflect um, the nature of those problems. And mm -hmm. if you're end up solving them, then you end up developing political legitimacy. But if you ignore the problems or use old scale models, you know, when everyone's going on about Biden as the, the New Deal president, I mean, the New Deal, like that's the last thing we need, right? Like what we need is, is something that reflects whatever the nature of the, and you can think of these as domestic problems too, mm -hmm. right? Fentanyl crisis, right? The opioid crisis, which is the most important domestic crisis we face and the government has failed utterly because of it, because the nature of the problem is such that the way we dealt with older problems doesn't fit fixing these problems. And therefore governing, it, government institutions lose credibility and people lose face in government. And then you have polarization and all the things that follow. Well, and this this actually gets to an interesting paradox in your work here and what we've talked about here, but also in uh, in your in your broader work is you've done a lot of writing lately about the application of history to our understanding of international relations. And I know you've got another book coming out um, on the subject thinking historically, which uh, we will we'll, we'll probably try to bring you back to talk about that one, too, when okay. it comes out. But but uh, but. The interesting tension, and I think about this as as historians who who try to relate history to policy questions, is we've just been talking about how hard it is to to de-anchor people from their past experience. And yet we also recognize that being able to make useful comparisons and useful understandings using our understanding of the past is essential to making good policy. So how do we get people to sort of appreciate the value of history while also recognizing that this doesn't mean that we have to rush to say, aha, this is just like the Cold War, or aha, we need a new deal. Or my my big favorite is the three M's, right? Everybody says we need a, a moonshot, a Marshall Plan. Um, oh my gosh, I'm going to lose my, I'm gonna, my Rick Perry moment. Um, it's everything's either a moonshot, a, 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 a Marshall Plan, or a third M that I can't come to, which might occur to me later on. But, the, but the, that everybody... The, but that's we need to have like we're instead of just having a a useful understanding of the past that helps to be humble about what we need to do with the future, we're sort of rummaging through the past to find that one thing that's supposed to explain what we're going to do next. So this is a great point, and it's it's uh, again it's for the thinking historically book. But one of the things a historical sensibility tells you is that the present is not always like the past one of the key and the future will be different. And so one of the things you want to ask yourself is 
you know, I make, you know, people say, what about Russia, Ukraine? And I say, in 1900, controlling the Donbass and having its wheat and its coal and its supplicant population in a world where formal colonialism and wars of conquest were normal and there were no international institutions and nobody cared what Russia did, that added to your power. In 2024, when coal and wheat do not add to your power, it's not a supplicant population, it's the exact opposite. Land is not a source of power. And uh, you're going to piss off the whole world that even if everything had gone beyond your wildest imagination and you had captured Ukraine, you wouldn't be any stronger than you were before. You wouldn't have added anything to your strength because 2024 is not 1900, right? That doesn't mean you everything is reinvented. As you know, one of the things that a historical sensibility develops in you is trying to figure out what is new and what is similar. When we talk about analogies from the past, one of the things we often focus on is we say, oh, well, this thing that we're talking about presently isn't like what happened in the past. But what you brought up in your brilliant description of the Cold War is, do we actually understand what that past was? Do we actually understand what happened in July 1914? Do we actually know how complex the Cold War was? We have this simple-minded view in our head of what actually happened. And one of the great things historians do is say, you know what, um, that Cold War that you think you're comparing it to, not only is it not similar, but you don't actually understand what happened in the past. Right. And a historical sensibility should sensitize you, not perfectly, no one's ever going to know what the new thing is, but... You you know, if life expectancy doubles and and most people on the planet are literate, and if information is available to everyone on a device they can hold in their hand, unintermediated by legacy institutions, the question you ask yourself is if you told someone that 100 years ago, would they say things had changed? They say absolutely they had changed. Now, the to your question about human nature, maybe human nature doesn't change, but certainly the circumstances people find themselves in change profoundly. And it's a balancing act, right? You're not reinventing the wheel. There are some models and some examples we can use from the past, like, huh, you know, the Gutenberg press comes out, we have 150 years of religious war. Maybe that kind of tells me something about the internet age. Maybe it doesn't, but they can be suggestive. They're not mm -hmm transferred whole hog they're like okay it allows me to test my assumptions it allows me to ask about because what we're doing as historians though we are very we're not very good at it explicitly we're asking where is the action at where is the causality where is the agency why do things change and what is changing them right and historians have all social sciences, all sciences, all knowledge does this, but historians have this kind of supple ability to say, well, some things are different than they were in the past. Some uh, are the same, but it's all oriented towards asking, why are things the way they are? And if I want to change them, I better ask, what is the causal mechanism changing things and who or what is changing it so I can intervene and change it, right? And that's why updating our assumptions about how the world works is so important and why, you know, if we're focused on ninth problems from 1900 and ignoring the problems of 2024, um, we could wake up one day and go outside and it's 178 degrees and say, huh, you know, maybe all that time I spent rereading Mahana McKinder wasn't the best use of my time, right? It's got some benefits, but, you know, given that the seas are boiling and the land is uninhabitable, worrying about sea power, land power might not have been the thing I should have like been obsessing about. So it would be, this is a, this is a heretical thoughts here at FBRI, but I would, but I, I will know. allow it, well, I'll allow I know. it for this conversation, right? But it's all well, right. Yeah. But, I, but I get the point. And well, and um, we have a couple of good questions came in and I want to try to fold them together a little bit. I mean, one is sure. from Brett, Ben Pribatuk asks this question about human nature in a different way. And that is what if scarcity is sort of hardwired into us? Um, and this is this is one of those, you know, there's the, the popularity of sort of, you know, large scale historical analysis is this all they're trying to figure out you know, what is what is essential about us? I mean, is it just that we can't recognize plenty when we see it? Yeah, because we're just we're just born to 
It's like, it's because it, it's a similar argument that people make is one of the reasons for the obesity problem that I see in the mirror every day is that, you know, that we are physically, we are, uh, we, we are we're attracted to eating the sorts of things that are putting on pounds for us to deal with work that actually we're not doing anymore, but we're still sort of, we're, 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 we're putting on pounds for against future famines. So we've, so said, we've, we've solved the famines, but we're still pot in the pack. I think you look great. So I, I don't know what you're talking about. But, thank you, but, Frank. That's why I have, I thank you. I appreciate yeah. that. Thanks, everybody. So, so I, I, it's, it's, it's well beyond my expertise to talk about, you know, the essential aspects of human nature. But what I will say is we do know that prospect theory, our fears of losses, drive our behavior more than our fears or our hopes for gains right yeah, so there is yeah. a sort of a worst case scenario planning aspect that, that's boiled into us but i would offer this sort of corrective or not corrective this one thing to think about that mo that alien who was visiting earth in 1974 or 1924 frankly within my lifetime if you had been walking down the street and saw someone kicking a dog Nobody would have done anything. Frankly, if you saw somebody slapping their kid in 1974, nobody would have done anything, right? Or there's this great scene uh, in Mad Men where they're all going out in a picnic somewhere and they just leave their garbage everywhere, right? Like, right. And, and over time, behaviors can change. Mm -hmm. um, now, what is the source of that? So I am of the view that the notion of tolerance, uh, the idea that we don't look at other human beings as necessarily the other, is something that over time has increasingly become part of the way we understand the world, right? Now, we see all the violations of it, and we get very upset about it, understandably so. But the notion that there are essentialist categories that define human beings being race, gender, sexual orientation, eth ethnic ethnicity, any of those sort of things, religion, which 100 years ago, well, of course, if you're a different color than me or different religion than me, you're different than me. And I should kill you. Like nobody questions this, right? Of course, you're a woman and you're inferior. I mean, of course, we're going to like measure your skull and, you know, figure out like the, and we now know that those are bad things and wrong things to believe. And we have changed now. So to a certain extent, I don't care about the human nature question as much as I care about the actual results. Mm -hmm. The actual mm -hmm. result is that we have not in a linear direction and not always in a constant direction, but move towards the notion that there are certain ways of thinking about fellow, fellow human beings that are not acceptable. And now, could this be tested in a World War III? Could this be tested in a dystopian hellscape that the problems of plenty might bring? Absolutely, because I do believe that that these these norms are something that develop over time and are encouraged and just, and you know, there is an, I, I dipped in this a little bit, but there's an enormous debate in anthropology, as you know, about the essential nature of when humans organize societies, are they going to be, you know, are they going to reflect these good sides of these bad sides? Of human right. Beings? Well, and, uh, and it's interesting because Greg Bloomquist has a question related to this of, uh, the, the notion of thinking in Huntingtonian terms here, the notion of different civilizations, right, is, is you know, uh, does do civilizational differences make a difference? And does that also shape the way that different people living in different places with different backgrounds will either view the nature of plenty, the nature of scarcity, or how to deal with it? So but, another good know. question, and I was just talking, um, I was having a discussion with my class when we were dealing with the big three, the Fukuyama, Mearsheimer, and Huntington. Right. And um, all of whom I think had important insights. My generous interpretation of Huntington is to say that um, questions of culture and identity matter enormously to human beings, questions of belonging, meaning, and purpose. Um, I think the civilizational model is kind of nonsensical and doesn't make a whole lot of sense. But I do think what, and they're not static and, you know, the, and I also think the difference is, I always tell these, this to my, you know, 
Chinese students in my class, you're more like me than you are like people living in the Chinese countryside, or I am like some of the people I see at an Eagles game, right? It's the differences. There are a lot of cross country cutting, but what I think Huntington got right is that human beings are not solely utility maximizers, right? So the Fukuyama S thing, we, and this is why solving scarcity still leaves us unhappy. We want to have a sense of meaning and belonging and connection. And we're in a very confused state about that now, because one of the problems of plenty is that you can pick your identity a la carte. You can make your identity through online connections. It doesn't have to be a physical reality. You know, back in the day, you lived in the village and, you know, you saw people and you understood what you did and roles were defined. And part of it might have sucked, right? If you were if you were gay or you wanted to leave the village or you didn't like the village, but there was a level of, 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 of certainty and explanation that was blown up in good ways. It allows us to sort of express our individuality, but also leaves people often at a loss, confused, disconnected, the kind of Durkheimian enemy, you know, the sort of, and, and I think that um, what Sam got was that human beings they they you know it's like his political order and change they they crave a certain level of order and they're willing to pay a higher price than perhaps we in our american mindset are often willing to acknowledge right yeah. people yeah. they're they they, they want to feel like they belong to something i i realize that every time i'm at an eagles game rudy i haven't lived in philadelphia for 30 years i don't know who these people are i get like semi-violent scream at the top of my lungs i'm like what is this it's my sense of belonging this is my tribe these are my people right there's no, no utility maximization there that matters still enormously and is not covered either in the Mearsheimer balanced power model or in the Fukuyama utility maximization model. That's that's a really good way to put it, right? To, and, and that's part of the the overall complexity, which which actually feeds into this nice question from Charles Burhan about, you know, if we try to understand scarcity and abundance, right? Are there cycles that we can identify in history? Um, or and also, what could technology do? Because we, we talk about technology, especially AI, right? What can technology do to help us to think in these longer terms? Would it be helpful for us to be able to think in longer terms to get a sense of, of, are we, are, you know, are we looking at a cyclical element here? Or if I understand your argument, right? What you're arguing is, is we there used to be cyclical in the sense that you literally had cycles of living and dying, but that we've actually overcome a lot of those Malthusian cycles. Right. But are there cycles of scarcity and abundance that we can imagine understanding and using that understanding to shape policy? So on the first one, uh, the argument is that we shattered that. So sort of typically um, there were physical obvious limits on what kind of population you could have. And as your population started to increase, you either needed to produce more economically, or you needed to acquire more land and more colonies, and therefore the states and empires that were able to acquire that and have a supplicant population where those that sort of succeeded were broken that cycle. Um, there's no longer a sort of a need um, to worry about that. Um, and so I do think there is one of the things I do worry about that is if we, through a scarcity mindset, do involve ourselves in some kind of World War III type of situation where, or the problems of plenty generate the kind of crisis and our reaction is one of scarcity, you could see, you know, obvious failures of systems that generate um, sort of collapse. Although I will say one of the things that I think that, again, we never take the W. I think if there had been something similar to COVID-19 15 years earlier, you would have probably had a lot more starvation, right? But the access to the internet and the incredible, uh, unbelievable sophistication of our supply chain networks were such that you were able to shift things around in an extraordinary fashion that, you know, Pfizer's a hero, but FedEx and Amazon are here in ways that we don't fully kind of understand. And that's, there's a technology yeah. behind it too and information behind that. Um, the information, uh, the technological thing is, I mean, we are 
on the cusp, I think, over the next 20, 30 years, where a variety of technological innovations will transform the energy situation, uh, will transform food, transform health. I mean, the kind of stuff that's going to be happening on the, the health sector in terms of it won't help us, but I think our kids, you know, they're going to have to get used to living to be 120, 125 in terms of you know, cancer deduction, um, uh, cancer, cancer identification and developing tailored therapies, just extraordinary stuff. Right. right. Um, all of which to the alien would seem good. I'm not necessarily convinced it's going to make anyone happier for the same reasons that I, I mentioned. One techno technological thing that I've been thinking about that I'd love to get your thoughts on as historians, we both know that you usually don't get a change to underlying unspoken assumptions, institutions and practices until you have a catastrophe, right? Mm -hmm. You need a World War One, you need a Napoleonic Wars, you need a World War Two, you need a horrible sort of situation. Um, the Cuban Missile Crisis was a slightly one where we came close and it was enough to shock the system. COVID-19 was not. I had this idea that if you could give everyone a headset, an AI headset and play out what various catastrophes would look like, various scenarios of, say, a climate crisis, the next public health, getting U.S.-China wrong, and people could see it and actually say, all right, I'd really like to avoid that. What are the policies I could pursue? Because as we all know, if it's June 1914, you're like, everything seems sort of fine. You know, if you're like, if you're a lord living in the countryside of France and summer of 1788 this is great life's amazing you have no you you're not running the scenarios that you're going to lose your head in a couple of years right. um and so i do sometimes wonder if there was a way of using history and but also these kind of new technologies to help people say all right what what would and again you have it's problematic you have to assign probabilities which are guesswork but let's run a bunch of different scenarios using ai using the past to look at what different plausible futures would look like look at the bad ones under the precautionary principle say like well how do we avoid that and should we invest a little bit in institutions policies and practices to make sure those terrible things don't happen but i don't know that's just kind of i don't i i like that i like that thought frank and and you know when i when I speaking broadly, right. The thing about studying history is it's a little bit like, you know, I like watching horror movies and history is a little bit like watching a horror movie, right? You know, you're watching the movie, you say, don't run up the stairs. He's waiting for you. Right. Cause <laughs> yeah. you know, what's happening. The characters don't. Right. And, and that can put you in a position where you assume that you're smarter than people are in the past. Yeah. When what we really have to get down, you know, get through our heads is that people in the past were making decisions. They didn't know what was going to happen tomorrow. And we don't know what's going to happen tomorrow. Absolutely. Right. So Perfect. Louis the 14th writes in his journal on July 14th, 1789, rien, uh, nothing because but that's only because the only thing he kept track of in his journal was how what he bagged at hunting that day. And so, but it's it's this great notion, right? It's this king, the kings in Versailles saying, up, oh, nothing special happened today. Meanwhile, they're storming the Bastille in Paris. Because how's he supposed to know, right? He's all the way in Versailles, which is now you can get there in half an hour on the RER. But once upon a time, it was a really difficult thing to do, right? But this, I do think that trying to come up with examples of people on the verge of big events, not understanding what was about to happen, that can have a, you know, that can have a, a, a salutary effect. And I'm, I'm, you know, I'm thinking about this idea about creating AI uh, scenarios for people to imagine what's going to happen. I mean, there's so many things we could talk about. Like in your book, you talk about the problem of Taiwan. And like, if anybody stops for five minutes to think about how awful a fight for Taiwan would be, and how counterproductive it would be for everybody. There's no way a sensible person would want to do that. And so what we spend our time worrying about is, well, what happens if somebody's not sensible? Right. No, and that's a great example. And I mean, I I, I wrestle with, in the book, as you know, Taiwan quite a bit, because I yeah. believe Taiwan is an incredibly admirable country. Um, I think that it's done all the right things. Um, I do think the U.S. has to stand for something. I don't like bullying. On the other hand, I recognize that China really sees this as their own. It sees it as their Florida. This is a terrible problem. One of the greatest policies of the last 50 years was to basically keep kicking it down the road, which is what we did. Um, I would love to return to that. Um, it was China. And I'm, you know, I'm clear about this. that decided not to. Um, but it's it's. 
it's a vexing, really difficult problem. On the other hand, um, when people talk about, you know, they this is, involves different parts of the you know, things that I write about, they say, well, we, we have to be able to defund Taiwan. And I'd say to my American friends, well, what happens the first nine times China loses? Do you think there's not going to be a 10th time? And what I say to my Chinese friends is like, when have you ever noticed the U.S. when they've been involved in a war to just say, OK, we're done. Right. Like and and we're going to sort of look, neither side has a, a proper appreciation for the fact that this would be terrible for both of them. And by the way, is a distraction from the problems. I mean, if you look at we're not entirely sure what the death tolls in China were from when they finally let things loose with COVID, but they're bad. They're really bad. And there's the problems of plenty are going to hit the United States and China as bad, if not worse than others. And so they have an interest to wrap their heads around these problems and to find some kind of way to work together to help to resolve them. Right. And I, you know what, Frank, I'm thinking you know, we, we could go on and on. We have spoken for an entire hour. Uh, it's been a real pleasure uh, listening to you talk about this book. Um, and, uh, you know, I do hope we'll get you on again sometime soon, but for now, for our, for our listeners are, uh, please check out the problems of the taming of scarcity and the problems of plenty, or check out any of the works by Frank Gavin, which are available in bookstores through that technological miracle that is amazon.com by all means, go check them out. Um, Frank Gavin, thanks so much for joining us today to talk about your work here on people, politics, and prose. Thank you, Ron. It was a real pleasure. And it was just great to be here with you. It was great. And FPRI thanks all of you for joining us. We also thank our sponsors and partners for their generous support. And we ask you if you have enjoyed this conversation to please tell a friend, bring a friend next time, consider becoming one of the sponsors and partners of FPRI. So because today's conversation is just the beginning, the world goes on and we're always here to talk about it at FPRI. If you've enjoyed the conversation, consider joining us again when we gather to analyze our complex world. To keep up with future episodes of People, Politics, and Prose and other events at FPRI, visit our website, fpri.org. Like us on Facebook, follow us on Twitter. You can follow the host of this program on Twitter slash X at Ronald Granary. And special uh, thanks in advance to anybody who can go on X and tell me what that third M I was thinking of to go with the moonshot of the Marshall Plan. Um, I will figure out a, a, a an appropriate token uh, to give whoever can help me remember that. But that's all we have for today. Until next time, for all of us at FPRI, for Frank Evan, thanks so much for joining us. I'm Ron Granary. We'll see you next time.